you're enjoying these videos on our channel, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for watching. I get embarrassed easily, and uh, I don't know, sometimes the time I'm most comfortable on stage than any place in the world. Uh, being around, you know, everyday people and stuff, I feel strange. I do. Sure. Yeah. Our, our company, the company that I was fortunate enough to work for, uh, Columbia and Epic Records, CBS Records, sitting there in New York and and having a roster at Columbia that was, you know, phenomenal. I remember giving a keynote speech at the CBS convention. We had the number one, three, five, seven, and nine records in the country. And Clive Davis, one of my mentors in the business, said, you seem to want more. And I said, yeah, so do you. And I was fortunate enough, he gave me the responsibility of taking on Epic Records. Well, the moment I laid eyes on Michael Jackson was when he was singing with the Jackson Five as a little kid on the Ed Sullivan Show. And uh, we at CBS Records at the time, I was with Columbia as the Vice President of Promotion. We just didn't really have that kind of artist on the label. A lot of it was classic artists, Barbara Streisand, Toby Bennett, The Birds, Bob Dylan. But being born and raised in the Midwest, rhythm and blues was always a very important part of my life. And to see that whole family just dancing and cool and, and their uniforms, or immaculate, and this goes way back. And I said, maybe someday we'll sign a family. So we had the Osmonds, which was nice. They did well, but the Jacksons were magic. And being from the Midwest, I would drive from Chicago to Detroit to catch the Motown Mondays that they used to have. And I would see Stevie Wonder, the Jackson Five, the Four Tops for $5. Things have changed. What, what, I, what I saw in Michael was uh, a young kid that was able to entertain all ages. I mean, I don't know the exact demographics of what he reached, but I would say just like the Beach Boys, you know, 60 to 70 year olds. Nobody got tired of watching him. And uh, the magic moments came when we were at our home with our daughters there watching the 25th anniversary of Motown and he did the moonwalk for the first time. I can still hear the scream in my young daughter's ears. You know, and that was just, you know, we were right about him, watching him and that's, that was how he motivated everybody from Jermaine and, and Tito and Marlon and Randy, they were, all, they were all energized by him in such a very special way. Whatever age it was, even when he was five or six or seven or eight, when he was on the Sullivan Show, he was motivating people in the audience and his fellow brothers and my sisters weren't in the band then. But what I saw in the Jacksons wasn't just Michael, but Michael was the motivator, and that's kind of hard to do. You know, there was in each group. Uh, I was not fortunate enough to be in the business in the 50s, but if you look at all those groups, whether it was Dion and the Belmonts, or uh, the Temptations had their lead singer, and the Four Tops had their lead singer in groups, um, there was Michael leading at that age when he was so young. And I met him when he was 19, so he had already been established. The Jacksons had already had their hit records. But there was something I felt that our company, as big as it was, which was the biggest record company in the world, Columbia Records, Epic Records. It seemed that the, the Jacksons, Jackson 5, hadn't put out a record in a while. Um, and the magic of what I saw that day of driving my car on my way home out of this ABC building, which was right next to the CBS building, there was hundreds of kids standing around the Warwick Hotel. And I just pulled my car off to the side of the road and went to the doorman who I knew, and I said, what's going on here? And he said, the Jackson Five are upstairs and these kids all want to meet him. And that was without a hit record for a long time. So to show you how things have changed, 
I went to the house phone, and I can tell you the room that they were in, room 805, things you remember. And I picked up the phone and I said, Michael Jackson, please. And they rang the room. And I introduced myself as vice president, general, senior vice president, general manager of Epic Records. He said, I'm a big fan, I'd like to meet you. I said, I'll be right down. And he came down with his dad and his dad's partner. And we just met, talked. And I asked him where they were performing, and he said they were performing in New Jersey, and then at Radio City Music Hall the next day, and it all started. When I first met him, it was kind of confusing because he was this quiet, shy, uh, somewhat introverted individual, and he was letting his dad do a lot of the talking, and I wanted to talk to him, which we finally did when he told me that he really someday would like to do his own music. I just, nothing wrong with that. Because you know, Motown had a factory. They were very successful. Um, I admire Barry Gordy. Uh, I never met him until recently at the BMI Awards when Gamble and Huff were being honored. And I introduced myself to him, I know who you are. He was very polite. He was very nice. I thought he might throw something at me, but you know, he was very nice. But the best way to, to answer the magic that sat there with he and I is when I invited him to the office just to come over and listen to music. Talking. What do you want to do that you haven't already done? I already had hit records. But when he came over to my office, Michael, he came over with his dad, he came over with Richard Aarons. They went and talked to the business affairs people about a deal that I would have had to approve at the end. But I said, go ahead. And Michael sat with me in my office. Well, I, I, Michael was very shy. Michael was very quiet. In fact, when his dad and the, his partner left my office, he opened up to me. We were talking music, his likes what he wanted to accomplish different than it he had already accomplished. And that's when the magic came out and he said he'd like to maybe produce and write his own music. Do you have any problem with that, Ron? And I said, absolutely not. That's the way he talked to me. Very specific. You know, it was like, yeah, Mike. I called him, I, yeah, Mike. Can I call you Mike? He goes, yeah. I said, well, he was like, I was, that was this huge building. It was a CBS building, Columbia and Epic Records. It was a huge company, and there he is sitting, talking with me. So I moved immediately from behind my desk and sat on the couch. He sat on a chair. I can tell you exactly where it was, in the corner on the 13th floor of the CBS building. We spent hours together sitting in my office. His dad was there. Joseph and Richard Aarons, and I said, why don't you guys go negotiate a deal and leave Michael with me? And Michael had a big smile on his face. And they left, and then I kind of felt like he wanted to have me away from my desk. I just got that vibe. So I came from behind my big desk and sat on the couch, and we just sat there and started to talk about, what would you like to do that you have not done? What goals would you like to achieve that you haven't achieved? And he said, I'd like to be in a studio and possibly write some music and pick my own material. I don't know how it worked at Motown. Maybe they picked the material for them, told them this is what you're going to record. But he wanted some freedom. I think that was the key. And with, with us, we're a bunch of young people. And we weren't dictating to any of the artists. We were fortunate enough, we were hitting home runs on artists that we signed. And um, I said, you know, Michael, you could really bring a lot of energy into this company by your family, your concerts. And this was all in a whole different conversation, sitting instead of behind my desk, on the side of my desk. He was more relaxed. It was just the right thing to do, I felt, just to sit there. It wasn't this businessman sitting there. And in those days, a lot of us wore shirts and ties to work in the CBS building. You know, it was kind of formal. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't think he liked that. You know, I think what he liked was I had a young staff, young people, because the success of that company was really its artists, of course, 
with the staff. And they were just, that's Michael Jackson. That's Michael Jackson. He's in Ron's office. He's in Ron's office. And I had an open door policy. And they were coming in just meeting him. And you could see how he enjoyed that. I was shy, you know, but I introduced them as who they were. And fortunately, I had experience on my staff. You know, there were, there were maniacs on my staff, music junkies that were coming in there. They were trying to dance like him in my office. <laughs> they just made him feel so welcome that day, for sure, in, in April of 1976. And I can't begin to tell you the feeling that I got that we were going to sign him if the deal made sense. But I wouldn't talk the deal to him. And I really didn't know what they were talking about down on the 11th floor. That came later. After Michael left the office, I called the business affairs people. And I said, what are they looking for? And they gave me a ridiculous deal that they wanted. And I said, I could only approve up to a million dollars. That was my, back in 1976, that was still a lot of money. And I tried to figure out how we were going to divide because you wanted more albums. You just don't want to give a million dollars for one album. So I figured, let me fill out this deal memo. I had to sign a deal memo and I filled it out, 333000 an album for three albums. That came to $999.99. Thank you very much. Figured I had my deal. Went home, came back the next day, to have Walter Yetnikoff, who was then the president of the company, say corporate would not approve the deal. Being a spoiled brat, being a, I said, why? I said, well, word is that the president of CBS Inc. said that Ron is losing his mind because he's signing a cartoon act. Wow. Well, you can imagine how I reacted to that. Cartoon act? Who said that? I want to go see Bill Paley, chairman of the CBS Inc., the founder of CBS. It wasn't him that said it. And I said, I'll leave this company. I want Michael Jackson, the Jacksons. Because we were signing again, bands that people had turned on. Boston, Meatloaf, Kansas, Lou Rawls, OJs, Isley Brothers, they were all hits. What more do you want from us? I was fortunate enough to be able to make decisions on who I wanted to promote, market, sell, advertise, merchandise, and they had me wrapped up that I could see Dancing Machine and all those records. But the real one that got all of us, if you can have a hit song, a number one record about a rat, and that was the statement that I made to the corporate people when they asked me, why do you want to sign him? And that's a question that's been asked of me. What did you see in him? What did you want from him? I said, wait a second. He had a number one song singing about a rat. Well, that was a movie. Oh, yeah? The song made the movie. It's not often that you have. When's the last time you heard a song about a rat? <laughs> there wasn't one. And plus his moves and his mannerisms and, and the way he handled himself. Never a foul word out of his mouth. Is as polite as anybody you'd ever want to meet. That's why I took him into my home before we signed him. Oh, here's what happened. I said to him, I will introduce you to two people that I have in mind to produce for Epic, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. He knew every record they had made. He knew about the OJs. He knew about Lou Rawls. He, Michael really was like a collector of records. He knew from the Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes and all the records. I said, well, good. We'll go to Philadelphia and you'll meet them. Really? Yeah. Got down to Philadelphia. I thought they were just going to go and meet. They wanted to start recording. Because Gamble and Huff were creative geniuses. I mean, they had drawers full of songs. And they were very successful with Philadelphia International, which is another one of our deals. And I said to them, hey guys, my turn. I need you to go into that studio and do what you can to come up with the right records. Well, it was like uh, releasing young kids in a toy store. You know, I mean, I did take Michael and that day Schwartz, you know, the biggest toy store. It was like, I mean, you know, 
how did they react? They were given, they were given, Michael was given freedom to create. I don't know what went on at Motown. I wasn't there. I know they were successful. I know that songwriting team of Holland, Dozier and Holland, and, and <laughs> I applaud those records. They created the Jackson 5. We didn't create them. We just took it to the next step. At the press conference, when we made the announcement, that was a very concerned moment for me. And we went to the Rainbow Room, and I was given some difficult moments from people that didn't want to see them at CBS, didn't want to see them at Epic Records, didn't want to see them quote unquote, not our quote, with a lily white company. I, it was a tough time. That night before the press conference, I received a couple of phone calls that were kind of like threatening. And that morning early, um, I went to the Warwick Hotel again, and I sat with Joseph and Richard and Michael. And I asked Michael, would you please be the spokesperson for the family? And I said, when you're asked, why are you leaving Motown to come to Epic Records or CBS Records? What are you going to say? He looked at me like I'm looking at you and everybody else, and he said, because everything is possible with you at Epic Records. That was it. What can I say? I wasn't coaching him. And he got in front of a big audience, New York Times Post, Daily News, Amsterdam News, stuff, you know, and they, from the back of the room came a question, why are you leaving Motown? He didn't say anything negative about Motown. He looked over at me and he said, because everything is possible with Ronald Luxemburg at Epic Records. If you're enjoying these videos on our channel, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. We look forward to hearing from you and we really appreciate all of your support. Thanks for watching.